The pandemic is still the headline, but the planet is also on fire. Tonight, we discuss the movement for a Green New Deal in Europe, in the United States, and around the world, and how that movement has changed, evolved, transformed, or not in the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm joined this evening, or indeed this afternoon, for my guest by a friend, colleague, very inspiring economist, economist and statesman, James K. Galbraith, my friend Jamie, who holds the Lloyd M. Benson Jr. Chair at the Lynn B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and a professorship in government at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome, Jamie, to DMTV. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you uh, all the way tuning in from Austin. Thanks very much, and it's very good to be with you as well. All right, so we'll jump right in. Jamie, everything has changed. Everything is moving incredibly fast. This is the, sort of the narrative that we're sold. Life is turned upside down. Our economy is plunged in crisis. Ideas are being ripped off the shelf. Paradigms are being thrown in the trash can. The geopolitical tectonic plates are shifting underneath our feet. How would you describe this present juncture one year after the declaration of the pandemic by the WHO? Well, I could only say I only wish. Uh, I mean, some things have changed. Uh, there, anybody with eyes to see, ears to hear with, can see that the ideas that were driving the global community are, uh, you know, as recently as 18 months or two years ago, are defunct. That, I, mean, I think, is, is, is obvious, uh, but uh, the hold of defunct ideas uh, is uh, does not disappear easily or immediately. Uh, so, I mean, just to take the case of the United States, already a year ago now, uh, in April of 2020, uh, in the crush of the emergency, any notion that there were effective limits on what the federal government can do by way of sending out checks and stabilizing people's incomes uh, was thrown away. I mean, it was thrown away for the business sector uh, through uh, both loans and loan guarantees and the and grants, but they made through the work of the Federal Reserve, but it was thrown away uh, uh, for the household sector uh, through direct payments, uh, extended unemployment insurance and other, and other measures. Uh, and this was, uh, you know, we had the experience for a year, uh, and uh, it was actually, uh, you know, in many ways quite successful. The uh, society did not melt down uh, in a way that it might otherwise have done, in fact, would otherwise have done if people had been subject to income losses and then evictions and foreclosures and utility shutoffs and all of the horrors uh, that uh, could, were bad already, but could have been much, much worse than they were. Um, they, uh, has the country then moved to the point uh, where it is effectively organized to take on the next phase uh, of, of, um, uh, of the challenges that in front of us? No, we haven't moved at that point. Uh, there's discussion about it. There's even in today's paper, we know that the administration is preparing legislation. We don't know exactly what uh, what it will consist of, but uh, there's clearly a sense that a new direction is going to be needed. Uh, does the does this country have the organizing capacity uh, to implement that? Uh, that is a very open question at this point. And we can go on to what's going on in other parts of the world momentarily. Yeah, you know, I think you think a year ago, Lots of people were saying, uh, citing the etymological origins of the word crisis, that it actually comes. It's sort of an epidemiological phrase to refer to a change in the course of a disease where things are actually getting better. So it's both a, it's both a kind of threat, but it's an opportunity for learning and for you know bringing in uh, those new ideas or you know healing a wound that's been gaping open in, in our in the global economy and I think now you mentioned the let's just stick with it with the case of the United States because I think it's it's illustrative and then I think we can go to other places in the world so you know in thinking about what how this crisis has maybe turned or what we've learned and how we've changed there's a lot of talk now about these bills first the ARP the recovery plan and then now this potential infrastructure bill as marking some break with neoliberalism. Now, first of all, I want to know from you, you know, does it feel one year after the pandemic that we've broken with neoliberalism? And if we have, or to the extent that we have, is this a simple case of when the facts change, minds change? 
Are, or are we being duped into thinking that there's some paradigm shift? Is there something more powerful underway? And I know I'm asking huge questions here, but you know, what is, how should we make sense of this? What, what is actually changing under our feet? Before we talk about the details of it, how should we make sense of how exactly things have changed in the past year? Well, just to take up the American Rescue Plan, which is the one concrete thing that we have uh, in front of us, um, I'd begin by, you know, first of all, uh, again, pointing to the experience of last year, uh, and secondly, to the political necessity uh, that uh, faces face the incoming administration. Uh, it's very clear here we have a very narrow margin uh, in the in the Congress. If you don't move quickly, effectively, and massively, uh, the chances are you're going to lose that in uh, two years. You have a president who is uh, has been around for a long time, has uh, some experience of uh, both Republican and the Democratic administrations. The characteristic of Democratic administrations, Clinton, Obama, was that they were too timid and they got beaten uh, and stalled uh, and uh, in many cases lambasted and ridiculed uh, for uh, uh, for not having done enough, uh, aggressively enough in their first in their first months in office. And you have the case of a Republican administration, well, actually several of them, uh, Reagan and then George W. Bush and then Donald Trump, all of whom did very big things, uh, things I may not have liked, uh, but basically front-loaded their agendas, got them in place, uh, and then were in a position, particularly in Reagan's case, to be more flexible in the the remaining years of the term. Uh, So the political lessons are there. Uh, and and then you also have the fact that uh, that the that the president is well I mean he's not exactly in the first flush of youth uh, and uh, it's, uh, people I think it's reasonable to say that old men in a hurry are not a bad thing uh, they uh, they recognize that they've got to get things done because they, they recognize that their time horizons are not unlimited so all of that's come together uh, in a kind of practical way uh, to put the U S. Um, in uh, you know, in the forefront of at least a change in attitudes toward uh, toward the macro level fiscal policy, the attitudes toward public finance. It's also, I think, practically recognized that the U.S. is. Uh, if not uniquely positioned in the world to make that change, it's got the strongest position amongst the Western countries to make that change, uh, because it is the country that supplies uh, the, the the settlement currency to the rest of the world, at least for the time being. Uh, and so, uh, this is a, a something which is open to the U.S., uh, which uh, is uh, would be a harder sell in a lot of other places. So that does this represent? a real acceptance of an alternative uh, theoretical framework for thinking about economic problems, I only wish. Uh, I I know my friends, uh, our friends, who have been advocating uh, for uh, such a change of perspective, uh, are, I think many of us are quite happy with the the immediate turn of politics, uh, but has the correctness of that perspective been recognized, acknowledged? Has it been taken up? Have people been uh, have people been have, have the doors of the uh, of the academic power structure been opened uh, to the uh, partisans of modern monetary theory? Uh, no, they have not. Uh, and so I think that uh, any real and deeper gains are, are are very much provisional at this point. And that just before you get to the structural questions, which I want to I want to take up as well. Yeah, no, I mean it, it, it's a very speci- it's a very interesting theory of political transformation as you're articulating one that really is about necessity or dragging these forces along um, by the kind of st- sort of structural conditions that demand it. It feels like a very sort of Angelus Novus theory that we're sort of being dragged towards these fiscal stimuli as we watch the destruction pile up behind us, that there's not actually, we're not, you know, the, the, what we're seeing in the case of the United States, and perhaps you can make the same mm-hmm. argument about the kind of painful process of arriving at what's now known as this recovery plan or EU next generation, 
uh, here in Europe, that this was, you know, after years of sort of dragging their feet, you know, net public investment falling to zero in the Eurozone, obviously um, people, you know, ailing and child poverty levels rising in the United States, that these kind of structural conditions sort of d demanded. And I think, you know, to me, looking, we're obviously convened here to talk about the Green New Deal. And I think understanding what's changing now is not, we, we can't just look to the past year, we also have to look to the past decade and to lessons that perhaps were not learned in 2008 uh, or in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008. Now, you know, the Green New Deal as a policy paradigm really gained some kind of popular traction, some, uh, some popularity in the wake of uh, the great financial crisis of 2008 in part because of a parallel that people were able to draw with 1929, with the fact that we were in a period of, you know, tremendous financial speculation followed by a depression that required the kinds of, you know, relief, recovery, reform that uh, Roosevelt had put on the table a century before. Um, you know, but then it felt like, okay, we didn't really learn the lessons uh, there. We didn't really get as far as putting a new deal on the table. And then the COVID crisis kind of fell into our lap, not exactly as an exogenous shock, but something like an exogenous force. So my question to you is thinking now, not just one year, but 10 years, how does uh, this present crisis change the kind of desirability or feasibility of something like a Green New Deal? Should we understand this crisis in that medium term process of, you know, okay, finally, our European leaders in particular are coming around to thinking, well, you know, austerity is maybe not uh, the, the most responsible way of handling this question of um, you know, providing for citizens. And maybe the U.S. is thinking, well, we need bigger stimuli to take care of people and think about things like child poverty. Or, um, or, or is that, are we not even there yet? Well, Okay, let me back up a little bit um, and just talk about what uh, I think is is going on. You use the term stimulus uh, that, as a description of the program. Um, and I don't think that demand uh, was ever actually the, the, the problem. And I don't think what is going on is appropriately described in those terms. Those were terms uh, that uh, were suitable uh, to, if you like, the uh, the the, the uh, post-war Keynesian era, uh, when you went into a recession as a result of an overbuildup of inventories and uh, laying off of workers and so forth, and then you 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 gave the economy a boost to to come out of it. What the pandemic actually did was to expose the extreme fragility of the entire structure that had been built up over 13 years since the Great Crisis and really over 30 years, which was heavily dependent on a, it's a very bimodal economy, a small group of extremely high income people uh, who uh, were in the business of producing advanced technologies for world markets, uh, and a vast number of people who were in the business of producing services for each other. Um, and both pieces of this got hammered in the pandemic. Uh, the, the, the technology sector, because uh, uh, there's basically no demand for uh, airplanes, for example, in a world in which a vast number of them are sitting on the ground, uh, and no demand for office construction uh, in a world in which offices are empty, no demand for retail malls in a world which is being taken over by Amazon, so on and so forth. Um, and the services side, uh, people can't be in direct contact with each other. Those jobs just evaporate like so much mist uh, in front of the morning sun. So they're gone. Uh, and they, some of them will come back, but many millions of them will not. Uh, what the programs did was to basically hold everybody in place financially through this. Uh, it was more of a balance sheet thing. People have rent, they have mortgages, they have utility bills, they have grocery bills, they have uh, they have uh, student debts to pay, they have all kinds of things. Um, and handing them out a check meant that they could continue to make those payments by and large. I mean, not everybody, and I was, you know, you know, I'm not going to minimize the suffering, except to say that without, those, without that assistance, it would have been much worse. And in fact, they discovered you could actually give a lot of people more money than they were making in their jobs. Uh, and this also kept the social situation stable. Economic stimulus, it is not. Uh, what's going on with the, with the rescue act, uh, plan is exactly, I think, as described, a rescue plan. Uh, it enables uh, people to get through another six months or a year uh, as uh, uh, maybe the pieces start to get put back together some way. But 
they can't go back the way they were. Things have changed. We are not going to uh, uh, return to the kind of economy in which uh, basic pe people's jobs were providing leisure time goods to each other. Uh, and we're not going to return to an economy uh, in which the advanced sectors are supplying a particular kind of, of advanced good to the world economy. That's got all changed. So what we have to recognize is that we have to to use the resources that we have in a way that's directed toward the problems that we actually are going to face. And I say, oh, 10 years ahead, uh, uh, 10 years ahead, obviously the, 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 a, a major, the major issue, if you want to put one on top of all the others is the climate crisis. Uh, it is the necessity of a green new deal and a green new deal is two pieces. One of it is energy transformation, resource transformation, so that we begin to stabilize the, ecosystem of the whole planet. And the other piece of it is the New Deal piece, which is to say something which is truly post-capitalist, something which is truly democratic, something which is uh, creates pra in a pragmatic way institutions that we can c continue to live with, you know, through the uh, through for for at least, you know, a number of decades and uh, into the future uh, as we continually uh, adjust uh, to circumstances. That's what we need to be thinking about. Uh, it is not uh, a, just a device to, for existing political leadership to make themselves more palatable. Uh, and that's very much the sense one gets about Europe. Uh, and uh, well, well, we'll see what happens. I, I think they, uh, the, uh, again, I don't want to hold out the U.S. as a uniquely uh, advanced case here, but we'll see what this administration is plotting. I do want to come to the question of what's impelling, the thing that's impelling us toward making some progress, and that is the experience of what's happening on the other side of the world. Right? Uh, this is, there's something very important uh, that we need to bear in mind, which it starts with, I mean, it didn't start with, but it uh, it certainly is expressed in a way which cannot be mistaken by anybody uh, by the pandemic. There were countries that dealt with it. There were countries that moved on the first day uh, to uh, place uh, controls on their borders and to get testing and contact tracing regimes in place and to isolate and protect themselves from uh, con from contagion. Many of them were small countries, uh, places like Korea and Singapore and Hong Kong and Taiwan uh, did well and uh, Cuba did well and uh, New Zealand did well. Uh, uh, but then there was also China. China's not a small place. China's 1.4 billion people. Uh, which managed to suppress the pandemic over the course of maybe six weeks or two months and get themselves back to a normal condition of life in a country which has also succeeded in transforming itself technically uh, over the last 30 or 40 years into one of the most uh, advanced uh, and uh, carefully or fully engineered places on the planet. Uh, so when we're looking at... Uh, you know, what's out there for the global population. Those of us who are not China uh, have to recognize that uh, demonization isn't going to work because a lot of people can see uh, very clearly uh, that uh, there is a level of competence which used to be characteristic of the West uh, and which the West has lost. And that's what the Green New Deal needs to recapture is a capacity to do these things in a way which is in in uh, consonance with democratic values, uh, in consonance with a popular will, uh, but that is actually also effective and not just cosmetic or, uh, uh, you know, as a sustaining of an, of an underlying power structure that isn't really serious about these things. Yeah, so let's let's bring it to to here in in, in Europe. Uh, you know, in, during my time as as the policy uh, director of for DM twenty five for this democracy in Europe movement, uh, in collaboration with you and and, our, and DMers across the continent, mm -hmm. developed this this vision of, of a green new deal for Europe, something that would have both of those components you outlined. Take seriously the urgency and demand for a rapid decarbonization and green transformation, and also uh, live out that uh, sort of Rooseveltian tradition and. Keynesian vision of, um, you know, sort of rebuilding a, a new economy and mobilizing um, the wealth that we have towards, you know, good, decent jobs and transformation of, of our 
more infrastructure. And, and what's happened in the wake of this Green New Deal movement, very much in the kind of pathetic and mimetic sense, is that the European Union has adopted this name of a Green Deal, essentially uh, greenwashing um, what is otherwise a quite austerian agenda uh, and, you know, obsessing over how they're going to, in various terms, unlock, unleash or nudge private capital towards uh, green investment, essentially uh, pulling the classic uh, European Union move of, of socializing risks uh, while privatizing gains in, in the green transition. And it's interesting, you put it in this way of, you know, are we going to be building a more cooperative perhaps post-capitalist economy in the course of this Green New Deal, or are we going to be uh, inflaming a kind of xenophobic and imperial way of organizing the economy? But it's you, know, you don't have to read too deeply into these intentions when you hear speeches from people like Guy Verhofstadt who stand you know, on, on their soapbox and say things like, we live in a world of empires, the United States, an empire, China, an empire, we... Europe must be an empire, you know, and this Green Deal is our strategy for be, remaining competitive in that world of empire and externalizing our carbon costs. Yes, we're going to be uh, the first decarbonized continent, but only by basically sending our emissions south. Um, you know, so what does it mean to take seriously this idea of a Green New Deal as a vehicle of cooperation as opposed to a vehicle for geopolitical competition, which really only promises to put us, set us back half a century um, uh, at a time when that type of you know, international coordination towards protecting the human species is, is so essential. Well, I would, generally speaking, recommend against getting into uh, a competitive struggle that one is going to lose. Uh, this is not a um, sensible countries and sensible um, leaders uh, steer clear of that kind of problem. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, one doesn't want to be remembered like Napoleon III, for example. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a bad look historically uh, to, to do this. Uh, so uh, what's required uh, is... Uh, you know, something that is much more oriented toward, uh, you know, an actual uh, practical plan of construction, and development, redevelopment. Uh, that's what. The, uh, that's why again, why this word "new" uh, sits in uh, between "green" and "deal." Not because we're looking for novelty, but because the New Deal was a historical. Uh, phenomenon that had that characteristic. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about that, because I think for particularly for European audiences, uh, a lot of this may not really be familiar. Uh, there's a tendency to regard the 1930s as the era of John Maynard Keynes, of the, of the governments came in and started spending and running budget deficits. But the New Deal, uh, while Keynes was a factor in, in his thinking, and it was, was known in the United States, was far broader uh, than the Keynesian element. It consisted of every conceivable uh, political movement from the late 19th century forward in the United States, the populists, the progressives, uh, the, uh, the social democrats from the, from, uh, from the upper Midwest and all kinds of other people, uh, a social credit movement. And it built up uh, a, it came in at a time when we were 70 years after the end of the American Civil War, and the south of the United States was an exceedingly impoverished and backward region. And the New Deal basically built it up uh, and created the conditions for uh, its emergence as a middle class society and ultimately uh, for the emergence of the civil rights movement, uh, but uh, which was not a feature of the New Deal in the first place, but uh, electrification uh, of, the, uh, of the entire American South and Southwest uh, were, was an essential piece of this, and then there was industrial development that goes along with that. Uh, the construction of a public infrastructure, infrastructure of governance, of schools and courthouses, of transportation, roads and, and airfields. Now, much of this was made easy by the fact this was the high era of, of the rise of fossil fuels, and particularly of oil. Now, we have a different challenge now, which is moving away from that. Uh, but the, the, the underlying uh, 
conception has to be similar. We have to decide what kind of society we want and how do we build toward it. And there, I think, you know, actually the pandemic has given us, in some sense, some very useful guidance. Uh, we we know uh, here here we are you and I talking in a way that a year and a half ago we probably wouldn't have done. Uh, if technically, as possible, it's certainly much easier now, and uh, we're much more habituated to it. Of uh, uh, that involves no no carbon emissions, no uh, no jet aircraft rides, no no jet lag, no hangovers. Uh, it's uh, you know it makes us a great many things are now possible and easy that were not done before. People are working from home, which means much less this commuting is necessary, which means much fewer, many fewer um, automobile vehicle miles, many fewer carbon emissions. Uh, the office buildings that were maintained, which are extremely expensive energy using glass and steel structures, uh, uh, not necessarily, uh, not may not be necessary to maintain as many of them into the future. One can go down the list of ways in which one can make the a whole energy picture better uh, without sacrifice of the quality of life. And in fact, to some degree, uh, with improvement of it. Uh, and as the pandemic itself recedes, uh, the last thing we want to do is to say, oh, gee, you know, we're just going to, to greenwash the previous economy because you just add a lot of green energy sources to what you had before. You're not dealing with the climate problem. You're simply increasing the CO2 load keeps going up, and that's the issue. You've got to have to figure out how to live well while actually using emitting less of that stuff into the atmosphere. Yeah, I think for all, for myself even, you know, just hearing how breathtakingly ambitious the New Deal vision was, not just the vision, the implementation was, um, is deeply inspiring. I think it's also jarring to contrast uh, that the dimensions of the original deal, New Deal with what is on the table in the form of this so-called Green Deal, which of course steals so much legitimacy from that concept and from the Green New Deal movement more broadly, uh, as it's taken root in places like the United States, but has so little of the content. And it's, you know, uh, it's not just the vision, it's also the politics that undergird that vision. It's the, it's the coalition for whom that New Deal speaks. I think in Europe, one of the challenges that we face as, as DM in, in trying to build a Green New Deal for Europe movement that is across the continent is that for so long, workers in Europe have been portrayed uh, for cynical reasons as, sub as well as substantive ones, as fundamental barriers to the green transition, as fundamentally the antagonists of the efforts to decarbonize. So we have a classic sort of proletarian and young precariat split. You've got the, the student strikers in the streets who are fundamentally opposed to the miners uh, in the countryside. Uh, and that there's no way to bridge those two constituencies and catering to the former will alienate the latter and catering to the latter will of course inflame uh, tensions uh, in, in the liberal parties rep that aim to represent the former. And so what we've ended up is this, uh, what I've, uh, with my colleague Pablo Vargan, previously called sort of democ uh, decarbonization without democracy. It's this way of doing decarbonization. We've talked about the reliance on the, on the private sector and, and nudging it with these, with green taxonomies that are deeply flawed. We don't have to get into the details of that. But essentially, it's not about driving a democratic transformation in the process of stripping carbon from the economy. It's about kind of preserving technocratic power and making as few as most sort of a very defensive position. These light touch interventions, which do not, you know, which which claim not to be threatening the social order the, and the underlying fabric of these communities, but in the in the process provide really paltry <laughs> sums. Se you know, is seven billion euros over seven years for a just transition fund. Right to say, okay, we know there's going to be some social dislocation in the process of the green transition. We'll just throw some pennies to the Hungarians or the Poles, right? Which of course is going to line the pockets of the the capitalists whose coal mines and in uh, factories are sort of put out of business in the course of this green transition. But this is not a, a worker empowerment. This is not even a jobs program. I spoke a bit before about the dominance. Are you, are you, are you serious? Seven seven billion over seven years? Yeah. I mean, I mean you, the, the Navy couldn't build an aircraft carrier for that in the United States. But, it, but it's being sold, you know, the, the language that Wunderland uses, uh, we leave no one behind. This is the European way. I mean, the, the most kind of um, pompous rhetoric around what the just transition means. And so I, tr I trust not many people are fooled. 
well, you'd be surprised about the quality of journalism in the Brussels bubble. But, you know, without trying to slander my colleagues too much uh, just across the pond, I think, you know, there's a question about there's a question about what I've, I've long <laughs> taken the view that Western uh, consumers of journalism are at least as as clever as the old Soviet readers of Pravda and Izvestia, uh, and that, they, that, that, that one should not overrate the power of of, of journalism journal of journalism to to uh, to fool people to believe things that they can clearly see are not true. But I think, but, but let, let me come, let me come to this question of, of of the you know the coalition because this of course this division that has. Uh, uh, it has its parallels in every democratic society. Uh, one can say that the loss of the uh, of the working class, particularly the white working class, in the United States was the phenomenon that delivered uh, the country to Donald Trump in 2016, uh, and that loss goes back to a split uh, that goes back 30 or 40 years, really beginning with the with the Vietnam War. So these are issues that have to be dealt with. But the way to deal with them uh, is to present a, a, a program that uh, meets the uh, uh, social and economic requirements uh, of uh, you know, of, of all significant factions uh, in the you know, all significant groups, uh, and again, I want to come back to the to to the model of the New Deal in that respect. The New Deal was not perfect; it did not meet the uh, social requirements of progress for African Americans in the United States, uh, and that came later uh, in the in the nineteen sixties. But uh, amongst the uh, you know, the, the political constituencies that it pulled together, it was very significant and wide ranging. Uh, and it did not just uh, focus on, on, on building dams and, and, uh, uh, and new industries and so forth. It was a project that built up communities. Uh, viewers in Europe may want to check out the website of a group called the Living New Deal, livingnewdeal.org, I think it is, uh, which maps out just exactly how many things happened in the United States, were built in the United States that are still with us, uh, that were products of the New Deal. I mean, there are many, many thousands of them all over the country. Uh, it was a very, very big, many big things, many, many, very much smaller things. But in addition to that, the New Deal was also a cultural and artistic uh, uh, phenomenon. It also supported uh, the communities that bring us together as a population that define our, if you like, our cultural and our national identity. And in a way, at the time, that strongly, uh, uh, strongly emphasized uh, the rights and the power of the, of, of, of the common person. This was the era of the common man. Uh, and you can see this in murals, you can see this in sculptures, you can see this in, in photography, you can see this in painting, you can see this in every dimension of cultural life that was backed by the New Deal. As we come out of the pandemic, we need to think about these things. We need to think about uh, what it will take to bring meaningful employment uh, to back to the whole population. This has been the scourge of Europe for decades, since the 1970s. Uh, they are not, for, the, for the Francophones, I'll mention a magnificent bande dessinée, Le Choix du Chômage, uh, by uh, uh, my friend Benoit Colomba and a, a colleague of his, uh, Duvillier, uh, which has just been published, uh, that uh, uh, illustrates this history for France. Uh, the story here is that I don't think that the network, if you like, of profit-seeking uh, services businesses, ordinary businesses, is going to return uh, in the scale that is required to provide people with meaningful employment. So we're going to have to, as a democratic movement, think about how to structure cooperatives, how to structure other kinds of entities that can make that sort of work available and sustainable. Uh, another economist, my friend Pavlina Cherneva, uh, has a, put a proposal together, which is uh, articulated in a number of national contexts, the US and Europe, uh, for a job guarantee for using, uh, basically for using the public employment program, public and nonprofit employment, as a uh, way for people to always have a job available, doing something useful, and so nobody has to be has to be obliged to be unemployed, to sit around waiting, uh, filing applications and waiting for someone to come calling. Uh, 
that is a device which causes people to waste years of their lives to lose their morale, their skills, their 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 meaning really of uh, of, of 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 making a contribution. We can we can do something about that. Uh, a job guarantee program is a very effective, I think, way to approach the problem. Um, and of course, as people are are uh, required by private sector employers, they'll hire people who are already employed. They'll hire people out of out of, away from the job guarantee, which is a good thing too. So there are ways to reconstruct our society, and that's what a green new deal needs to think about doing in a very wide-ranging and comprehensive manner. For the final section of the conversation, I think it would be helpful to shift from looking at these cases. We've spent a lot of time talking about the case of the United States mm -hmm. for very good reasons because of its hegemonic position and its particular leadership and, and the privilege that it has. Shakily hegemonic position. <laughs> Shakily hegemonic position, temporarily hegemonic position, and talking about Europe naturally because mm -hmm. this is uh, the democracy in Europe movement. But of course, when it comes to climate change, it's it's going to be global or uh, or it's going to be nothing at all. And so... In the case of Europe, if you look at how I mentioned this in my previous rant before you spoke last about the ways in which um, there's a real risk of decarbonization on the inside of the continents, simply exporting those carbon emissions to the outside and then kind of holding up this A plus report card to the world and marching through the halls of COP26 in Glasgow and saying, you know, aren't I great, uh, pat me on the back kind of thing, which Europe is very inclined to do in this new strain of exceptionalism. So, you know... Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad to say, David, that you and I are not citizens of a country that has any tendency to pat itself on the back. <laughs> it's an epitome of modesty and self-effacement. <laughs> Uh, you know, J Jamie, as a as a young cosmopolitan, rootless Jew, I feel uh, I, 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 I belong to have no patria. But I do. I mean, I, I wonder, you know, I think I've been disappointed. I'll be honest with you. I've been disappointed in proposals that I've seen tabled in the United States, certainly in, in Europe, for how we might internationalize. The Green New Deal. What do it mean to go global? To something that you know, uh, my colleague Yanis Varoufakis uh, in Meta Twenty Five has we've written about how we might put together something like an organization for emergency OEEC for the twenty first century, something that could really take this take on this scale. You know, what do you, do you? How do you feel about think, thinking through where the Green New Deal is at? What are the barriers to thinking through this question of how we can deliver a global Green New Deal, a global green and just transition, how we can have the conversation you were just suggesting that we have about what kind of society we want to live in, about what kind of jobs we want to provide, about what kind of lives we want to live. How do we begin to have that on the scale that it requires, given that no country's green transition uh, happens in isolation? Okay, so let's, let's begin to uh, take this up in two pieces. The first piece is that for dealing specifically with the problem of, of climate change on the planet, one has to deal with the largest economic entities, and they are North America, Europe, and uh, and China, essentially, um, China, Japan. Uh, and those are that's a manageable coalition. If you put it together and do it in a serious way, you can make a very serious effect. Now, obviously, you've got other parts of the world. You've got uh, you, you've you, you've got uh, you know, deforestation is an issue, and you've got a whole host of other things. Uh, but uh, putting first things first, one has to go out for the big prizes and get them under control, and then uh, and then proceed. As far as the rest of the world is concerned, oh, and I should mention India is also a very big case. Uh, the as far as the rest of the world is concerned, uh, then to my mind, the first thing that one has to do uh, is to put the financial relationships between the wealthy and the less wealthy countries on a uh, uh, on a just and sustainable basis uh, debts that will not be that cannot be paid will not be paid uh, debts that are burdensome and uh, oppressive need to be written down or written off uh, and we need to have a structure for preventing uh, for, for getting away from this idea that that development is a function of uh, of, of foreign investment and or the accumulation of new debts, uh, my friend uh, Luis Carlos Bresser Pereira in Brazil is a very good argument that while we can have a I mean, get benefits out of trade uh, and particularly learning and transfer technology, the country should maintain uh, control over their own financial 
uh, environments, uh, and that it should be facilitated by international organizations. So if we can make that change, uh, it's actually within the ambit of the charter of the IMF, but the IMF has lost sight of it. If we can make that change, uh, and then we would have to restructure and really uh, change the, uh, the power position of the financial sector in the rich countries. You're going to restructure creditor-debtor relationships. You're going to basically be reducing the financial claims and therefore the wealth of the oligarchs of the, of, of, of the West. And that's a big challenge for any democratic movement. I mean, this goes back to, uh, let's mention our friend Yanis Varoufakis, be the first to remind us that you can have oligarchy or democracy, but you cannot have both together. They are not compatible. Uh, that is uh, something that the Athenians do very well. Uh, and uh, they're, they're, uh, the, some things are, are reproduced throughout history. Yeah, just to just to stay there for for one minute, just because well, mm-hmm. personally, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. You know, uh, we should we certainly certainly share this this vision of of this broad restructuring of the global economy as the kind of precondition to any serious conversation about what a global green new deal might look like. Certainly about what the claims of justice or democracy might look like in those countries which are stru- stuck in these relations of uh, of dependence um, along the periphery of the global economy. You know, uh, the IMF may have its headquarters uh, in Washington, D.C., but uh, let's not forget a gentleman's agreement that ensures uh, European leadership uh, at its helm. So I wonder, you know, if you're speaking, you're speaking, of course, to a broadly North Atlantic audience, but lots of Europeans who are there and who care, who care about this, this issue. And I wonder, you know, what are the chief barriers to delivering this kind of transformation? You know, Jamie, you've had great experiences, not only working in uh, domestically in, in U.S. government, but traveling the world and working with different governments and seeing that multilateral system uh, and it's the promises and its perils and its false falsehoods and its opportunities for transformation. And I wonder, you know, looking at this crisis, many have described what we're up against as the greatest debt crisis in history, in the heels of this pandemic, which could become even worse as we end up in a world where the global north is broadly post-pandemic, and the global south is certainly not, is certainly mid-pandemic for a couple of years to come. You know, how do we make sense of the opportunities that, from the global north or indeed from the global south, we might have to transform that system? Especially given what we're being told is a historic political opportunity structure with a sort of alignment of non-national populist forces in those two great blocks of of Europe, the United States. Well, let me speak to the situation, first of all, internally in the United States, uh, because there's there's a a consciousness here uh, that is going to be raised if it hasn't been raised already as time goes on. American households remain deeply in debt. Now, it's obvious that giving them funds enables them uh, to get by. (coughs) But uh, an increasing percentage of people are behind on their rent. Uh, and are on forbearance on their mortgages. And at some point, uh, those bills are going to come due, and the question is, what happens then? Uh, Do you uh, say, oh, it's too bad, you have to uh, basically head out on the street so your places can be repossessed? Or do you say, look, no, we understand uh, what we what you had to do, losing your job, losing your income, staying home for a year, year and a half, uh, was it necessary for of a larger society for public health, uh, and therefore uh, these debts are gone. Well, if you make that case internally, you can make it also externally. You can make it with respect to the whole world. Uh, and so, I think there's some, you know, there's 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 there is a a a kind of uh, sympathy, uh, or at least a common interest here, uh, which is going to be harder to conceal to pe- from people as time goes on. Uh, in terms of the wider world, I mean, these are, these are issues that I've dealt with all my life, uh, going back to the, uh, uh, to the New York City financial crisis in 1975 when I was 23 and on the staff of the House Banking Committee. And I was called upon to draft the first plan and the, put in it with my 23-year-old enthusiasm that the bondholder should take a, uh, should take a hit. 
Uh, they should be they should be haircut as part of any any resolution, and this provoked a telephone call and a, probably a good way to wrap up the show to tell the story. That telephone call from a senior figure, a former governor of New York, resident of Georgetown by the name of Avril Harriman, who wanted a briefing on this subject. Uh, and my boss, the congressman, very good guy, social democratic congressman from Milwaukee, Henry Royce, sent me over to brief Governor Harriman, who greeted me in his drawing room. And uh, he was in his pajamas. He'd broken his hip. Uh, he had a, there was a, 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 a Van Gogh on the wall and a, a Degas ballerina under glass. And between the two of them, I delivered my, my, my little ex explanation of why I thought the bondholders had to pay, uh, had, to, had to take a hit. And he leaned forward on his cane and he said, I understand completely capital must pay as well as labor. Uh, and I think it's a pretty good story. Um, this, this, in this situation, we all understand that, uh, frankly, we're all in the same boat. Labor has already paid. Uh, capital has not. Uh, and fixing things at the national level, the international level, is going to require a big adjustment for capital. Uh, it is one which gets us back to situations we have lived with, at least I have, because capital played a much smaller role and banking finance played a much smaller role in the years before the 1970s than it did afterwards. Uh, and those years were more stable, more prosperous, uh, more democratic in some respects uh, than the one since. Uh, and we simply, as I say, we cannot be ruled uh, democratically and financially at the same time. And for me, this is an easy choice. Well, on that call to solidarity, <laughs> on that call indeed to, to courage for whatever 23 year old is watching now who happens to hold the same <laughs> sort of uh, hold the, 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 their pen hanging over the, uh, the policy to, to drive mm -hmm. us towards a more just and democratic world. I wanna thank my esteemed colleague and guest this evening, Jamie Galbraith. It's a pleasure to see you and have you on DMTV this evening. It's always a pleasure, David, and keep up all the good work and, and good luck as, you go, as you're heading off, I know, to Ecuador for, for the cause of, for, for a very good cause in a few days. Indeed, so stay tuned. Thank you all for watching. Please make sure to subscribe to DMTV, to donate to DM25, to join the movement if you have not already. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you here this evening and I uh, hope to see you soon. Take care.